Ave Maria Purissima, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, on Good Shepherd Sunday this year, I'll tell you two, two stories to start off with, but we need a little background in order to appreciate uh, what I'm going to tell you. So years ago, I found myself uh, living around a school staffed largely uh, by guys who uh, loved to argue, read Aristotle, they had liberal arts degrees, there's nothing wrong with that, but they kind of looked down their noses at, at, at people who hadn't had that kind of a background. And uh, they also had this, uh, a lot of them had sort of pretensions to be uh, gentlemen farmers, and this was something more in their minds than reality, so as if they were gonna have, walk around wearing uh, tweed jackets and smoking a pipe and looking out the window at their sheep happily grazing in the pastures and so forth. Now, when I was coming up, one of, my, uh, one of the most devastating comments my dad could ever make about somebody is he'd say, you give that guy a coop full of chickens and a box full of matches and he, and he couldn't fix dinner. And that's the kind of guys we're talking about here. Um, you know, so the, that's the other piece of information you need to appreciate uh, these stories. They're arguing all the time with spotting Aristotle, looking down their nose at peoples, and these are exactly that kind of a guy. So anyway, the first story has to do with, with shearing. Uh, they, they bought some sheep. And as most people have noticed, sheep have something called wool. And it doesn't fall off on your average sheep. And so they, they realized they had to shear them. So they came up to me because they knew we raised sheep and, uh, and said, have you ever sheared? And I said, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know where that was going. I said, I haven't been on a shearing crew or something like that, but I know how to shear what? Well, you know, we want, we want you to shear sheep. And I said, I said, I'll show you how to do one. Uh, do you have shears? And they said, well, no, uh, they're pretty expensive. I go, well, as a matter of fact, they are. And they said, so, they said, so we're going to get dog clippers. Now, to appreciate the profound stupidity of this, Imagine that you, uh, you just bought uh, 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 40 acres that, that was pretty heavily wooded, you know, got big oak trees, maples, and so forth all over the place. And, and uh, the guy says to you, I'm going to log this. And you go, okay, what do you, you got a good chainsaw, John Smith or something? He says, no, I'm going to use a butter knife. Think, okay, right. Write me how that, let me know how that goes. This is the kind of mentality. So they bought a, a dog clippers. They call them dog clippers because they're for clipping dogs. And you call sheep shears because they're for shearing sheep. So anyway, they get the dog clippers. And they managed to make about a three quarter inch nick in one of the fleeces. And I'm not exaggerating, that's all. And then it's small, the clippers, which is about what one would expect with, with that sort of thing. So that's the first, uh, that's the first little anecdote. The second anecdote, and then I'll, I'll draw these together. I'm walking by one day and I look out, it's a, a fall day, really sunny, and one of the ewes is out there in the pasture and she's, her, basically her rear end is starting to get paralyzed, she's staggering around a little bit on it, the coupling's all messed up, and I go, wow, that looks like grass tetany. Now, we get that in the spring, at least where I'm from. What happens is you have, you have a, a, a really good rain and then it gets really warm, so the grass just springs up really quick, and then, things like sheep or cattle, if they're grazing on it, there's something wrong with that grass that grows up like that, and they, they get a magnesium deficiency, and they'll start getting paralyzed, and you gotta pour magnesium citrate down, to get, it's like a magic trick, they can be down and they get right up like that. At any rate, I thought, well, that's weird, it's in the fall. Well, I'll call Dad before I go talk to these guys. So I called my dad and told him, he said, oh yeah, that's what it is, you gotta get some mag citrate in pretty quick. Because you got about 24 hours or so, I don't remember exactly, but if you don't get it done, she'll be paralyzed, then you, then you gotta put her down, you gotta kill her, because she'll never get up. So I went and, and talked to one of these guys, the tweed jacket, kind of smoke a pipe and look at your sheep out the window. And I said, you know, uh, it looks like you've got grass tetanus. You need to get some mag citric. I don't know where you get it here at home. You just go to the feed store, but I, I mean, I don't, but you need to get that and get in there quick. And he says, well, I haven't read that in the book. You know, well, the response is, well, I haven't read it in the book either. My dad hasn't read it in the book, and I'll bet the sheep hasn't read it in the book, but that's what we've got there. And uh, 
it, it's kind of extraordinary. So what did they do? Nothing. So three or four days later, here you have this paralyzed you, and they drag it into the barn, and I happen to be walking by, and I look, and they're, they're giving it a shot of penicillin. And I walk in, they go, what are you doing? And they look up at me like I'm the world's stupidest guy, we're saying, we're giving it a shot of penicillin. I, can, I said, I can see that, that's an antibiotic. This thing's paralyzed, it doesn't have an infection. It's got grass tetany and you gotta put it down. Well, they, you know, they just dismissed me and kept shooting full of penicillin, so they're throwing good money after bad. The end of the story is the thing dies, of course. Now, if you're raised right, you may or might, may not know anything about Aristotle, you may or may not know anything about a sheep, it's not really important. But one thing you do know if you're raised right is when wiser, more experienced men are talking, you shut your mouth and open your ears. That's just common sense. We have a whole thing called the fourth commandment about that in a real formal sense. But with people experienced, you listen to them because they've got the gray hairs, they've got the battle scars, they actually know what they're talking about. I'm no expert, we raise sheep, but there's plenty I could learn about sheep. But if you know nothing about sheep and someone actually raised them for a living, it might kind of be a good idea if they give advice to at least take into account. These are bad shepherds. They weren't the slightest bit interested in the truth of the situation. They actually weren't the slightest bit interested in what the sheep, the sheep that they had, actually needed. They made up their minds as to how things ought to be in, in their little ideal uh, sheep ranch, and they didn't want to be bothered with facts. They actually weren't read, you know, they, they, weren't, they didn't care. They'd already decided how it was going to be and how sheep were to be treated, etc. So not only are these the kind of guys that aren't going to lay down their life for their sheep, in a certain sense, they were happy, in a certain sense, to let those sheep, the sheep suffer or die if caring for them became inconvenient, didn't fit into their little uh, mold, their preconceived little mindset, and uh, if they did, didn't get, see that care required in the book that they wanted to look in. Bad shepherds. Nobody is requiring them to raise sheep. No one requires anybody to raise sheep, but if someone does start raising sheep, then he's taken a responsibility to take care of the sheep as sheep. Raw responsibilities just come with the territory. You've got sheep, now you've got to take care of them. If you're raising sheep, you have to care for them. That care is not determined by what you think. It's determined by the needs of your sheep. That's, it's just, it seems common sense. So it's not preconceived notions. It's not by, uh, it's not by looking over and saying, well, I'm gonna do exactly what my neighbor's doing with his sheep. Well, they, why, you, you know? They might not need the same thing that your ears do. You determine what to do with your sheep by what the sheep need. And one of the things is to not be mistreated. Animals don't have rights, of course. Sheep don't have rights, but sheep are, sheep are creatures of God. Which means that we have to answer to God for how we care for them. Those guys have to answer to God for how they took care of those sheep that they took responsibility for. Now, if that sheep, uh, if, if a sheep owner mistreats sheep, uh, what, what actually happens is that mistreatment will change the person. If you mistreat an animal, it changes you. It's going to change something. There's going to be a disorder. And there's nothing the worse or more disordered the treatment of that sheep becomes, the more disordered the person becomes inside. He's not only violating his responsibilities, he's just perverting himself by not actually doing his duty, huh? So in this case, um, their mistreatment was really rooted in intellectual blindness. It's bred by a certain kind of arrogance and, uh, and a superior attitude. And any time we have one of those, look out. We're all prone to that stuff. Pride, thank you very much, Adam, is part of the human condition. We, we want to be humble. The, the more arrogant we are, the more blind we're going to be in certain areas. And then we don't have that light that we hear of, especially in the last gospel. We talk about the light that came into the world. Now, obviously, all this stuff applies to the pastor and to the church. All too often, they don't seem to be a bit interested or very interested in the truth of a particular situation. 
and what their sheep actually need. They made up their minds as to how things ought to be, how the parish or diocese ought to be run, don't want to be bothered with facts, already have these preconceived notions. Not only not laying down their lives for their sheep in a certain sense, they're happy to let their sheep uh, suffer and die if caring for them in the way they need to be cared for becomes inconvenient or doesn't fit into their preconceived little mindset. Hey, you know, it's all right, I'll do whatever I need as long as it doesn't impinge my golf game, require me to do this or spend too many hours in the confessional or this or that or the other thing, huh? It's really common. They're bad shepherds. No one actually requires a man to become a pastor. He could have gone into the cloister. He doesn't have to be in pastoral ministry. There's a lot of guys in pastoral ministry that don't belong there. Don't think you need me to tell you that. The responsibilities, though, come with the territory. These are a lot more serious kind of sheep than ones covered with wool. Cornelius de Lapide talks about the responsibilities of the primary pastor, which is the bishop. Oh, how great the vigilance required, vigilance required of a bishop. Brought to guard, care for, feed and save so many thousands of souls. Oh, how great a number of prelates perish. Not because they lived wickedly, but because they did not correct the wickedness of others entrusted to them. You think of the Dallas Accords. You know, we have this big crisis, which is like the world's worst kept secret that we have perverts in the priesthood. And so then it blows into the press, and they meet in Dallas, and they have these big Dallas Accords. Well, I mean, in and of themselves, they're actually immoral, but without even going into that, you know, what, what's the result of it? We have to get all this training, you, you, you know, so learning how to report. The reporting was never a problem. I think these incidents were reported. The problem was nothing was done. You have 2 to 4% of the priests that are monsters and 70% of the bishops that move them around. Well, in a public school, if you had some guy praying on the kindergarten, and go, oh, the principal moves him to third grade. Uh-oh, had a problem with third grade. Let's move him down to second grade. Oh, no, we're doing it again. We'll move him to fourth grade. And on and on and on. Well, that's exactly what the bishops did. That's exactly what they did. In the Dallas Accords, it only pertains to priests that get in trouble with somebody under 18. Is that a legal decision or is that a moral decision? I don't think you need me to point out that's bad shepherds. Bad shepherds. Fingerprinting, seriously, we didn't know who it was? How many of these things weren't solved because of a fingerprint? Let's get real. Training, I, I had to go to this, this training years ago, it's called Virtus. They have these really helpful things like cut the hedges down in front of your house in case somebody's hiding behind it. I don't think that was what was going on. We all know it wasn't, huh? Great number of crowds perish, not because they lived wickedly, because they did not correct the wickedness of others entrusted to them. Politicians who go to communion every week. They need to be corrected. And on and on it goes. Priests. The great doctor of the church, St. John of Avila. The obligations of a pastor are so many and so great that he who fulfills even a third of them will be estimated by the people to be holy. But if he's satisfied with only that, he will not be able to escape burning in hell. That's true. That's true. 
And what do we see in so many parishes about how the sheep are handled? Yet these programs, and what we're really dealing with with almost all the Catholics anymore, and it's just a sad truth, is practical heathens. We're indistinguishable from the general population. Indistinguishable. Catholics for one hour a week. How much prayer? Do the priests teach them how to pray? You can tell how many people make thanksgivings after they receive the Holy Communion. They come to communion, but it's a stampede to get out of that church. Our Lord is still present in them, but they don't even seem to realize that. There's no knowledge, very little charity. How much salvation is there? How many people are dying in the state of grace? It's a scary thought. Now this is not from an intellectual blindness. This is from a spiritual blindness. There's a spiritual blindness that we can get. Priests are extremely prone to it. But all of us as Catholics are, but priests especially. Trying to cut corners, trying to say God said this, but as soon as you have that but in on anything, that's the end of our religion. Why do we keep the rules? Why do we have rules? Really quickly, you don't need someone to walk around and tell you, don't put your hand on a hot stove, don't stick yourself with a knife, don't drink things that will make you throw up. You have natural senses to protect your natural life. If you bump into a hot stove, you jump back. If you stick it with something, something sharp, you know because you can tell these things are threatening my life. How can you tell about supernatural life? It was poured into you when you were a baby. You got put in a state of grace for most of the people here when they were baptized. You couldn't feel that. You can't feel the state of grace. It's supernatural. So the reason for the rules is to tell you as long as you're inside this fence line, you're safe. You're not in danger in your supernatural life and you can actually grow. And if you die in that condition, you get to heaven. But if you crawl that fence and get out there in a bad pasture, you've just died supernaturally. And then if you die naturally, you can't get to heaven and that means you have to go to hell. So the rules are from love of God putting the church here to tell us how to keep this supernatural life into us that Christ our Lord died to give us. And our Lord tells us, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So we want to keep the rules, not because of the rules, but because we love God. And we want to please Him in all things. We know how pleasing it is to Him that we're meticulous about doing His will in all things. So we love the rules, not because they're rules, because that's weird. We love the rules because they're an expression of what's best for us. God has told us so. And we don't have to understand that. When I was little, my mom and my dad just told me things. They didn't, they didn't give me all the explanations. They just told me things, and I knew they loved me, so I wanted to do that. God gave us the Ten Commandments. He didn't give us the Ten Explanations. That's the job of the priests. So we're supposed to explain why the rules are here. But we want to keep all the rules because we love our Lord. But as soon as we start cutting corners on it and saying, yes, but spiritual blindness. The more disordered the yes, but the more spiritual blindness. And then a hardening of the heart comes along. What is the hardening of a heart? You read about Pharaoh and it says God hardened his heart. What does that mean? Why would God harden somebody's heart? Well, it's a manner of speaking. God doesn't actually harden the heart. Here's what happens. You get graces. Graces to be holy. God desires the salvation of every man, and it would be a heresy to deny that he'd be a heretic. And he gives graces, sufficient graces, for everyone to be saved. But many people won't be saved, and it's always their fault. Why? 
because they just don't want to go there. That's going to cost them. I don't want to do that. Yeah, I see that. Every time we sin against the light, we're piling up a judgment against ourselves. There's four possible states of a soul after a mortal sin. Perfect contrition. A person who commits a mortal sin, then they, they get the grace to completely repent because they out of the love of God. God is so good. I'm so sorry I offended such a loving God. Perfect contrition. So the sin is all forgiven right then, even though we still have to go to confession at the first possible opportunity. Imperfect contrition. We're sorry for committing that mortal sin because God is good and we love Him, but we're more scared of spanking, you know, I'm going to go to hell if I die like this. And so we make a good con confession and we're good to go. Defective contrition. We're sorry for that mortal sin, but not enough to really do what it takes to change our life. Yeah, I don't want to go to hell, but I don't want to block the internet. I don't want to go to hell, but I don't want to get rid of that whiskey. I don't want to go to hell, but I don't want to move out. I like living with her. I don't want to go to hell. Dot, dot, dot. That's defective contrition. So there's some sorrow there. And you can work with them. Tell a person seriously, you're going to go to hell for this. And a lot of times the people with defective contrition just by a good conversation with someone they know loves them or a priest, they'll get their mind right and make a good confession and be back on the path. But here's the really, really scary one. It's the reprobate sense. The reprobate sense happens when someone has so abused the graces that God has given him that he no longer wisely cares about his salvation. Ha ha ha, I guess I'll go to hell a lot of my friends are. When a person gets to that point, God withdraws the grace. Not because he doesn't want the guy to be, to be saved, because he just basically slipped himself over from the mercy of God under the justice. They're never separated, but what we, and from our point of view, you can think of one as more emphasized. God doesn't want him to suffer for all the graces he's is abusing, so he removes those graces, and the guy lives like that, and typically when he dies, he goes to hell. That's what it means to have a hardened heart, is the reprobate sense. The bad pastors, it's not uncommon. I wish that weren't true, but it is. You don't have to tell a priest that he can't do this, that, or other thing. We know. We know the rules. It's not news to us. And if we keep abusing that grace, sin mass when we're not in a state of grace, confecting the blessed sacrament, all of them, and then giving ourselves communion, etc., etc. What is that doing to us? It's harder and harder, more and more and more. So the priest descends from a teaching in church. He descends from contraception. Spiritual blindness. Every time he says Mass, he's pounding himself deeper and deeper and deeper. <coughs> Bad shepherds. Huh? Why don't they preach on that stuff? Sometimes people think, and I used to think too, that it was because they were afraid of what would happen in a collection basket. That's not really the reason. The reason for a lot of priests is because they're so needy emotionally that they're actually directing the people towards them. It's very symbolic sometimes, and I'm, not, I'm making a very general statement, I'm not talking about all priests right now, but the symbolism of it, when the priest is facing the people, because he can focus all that on himself instead of pointing the people towards Christ, he can point them towards himself, and that's extremely common. And he doesn't want those people to be mad at him in any way because he's so needy, he's getting something from them. Instead of turning to Christ, who's the only one that can fill us, he's trying to get something that you can't actually get like that. It's a mistreatment of the sheep. It's a mistreatment of the sheep. And to the, to the degree of the disorder, more disorder the mistreatment, the more disorder in the soul of the priest. What is the priest really supposed to do? He's supposed to direct the people toward Christ. That's what the Good Shepherd does. The priest is here to bring Christ to the people and the people to Christ. It's about charity. It's about true love. 
I'll just read you something we've seen. See, your kina de Vendruna de Mas. Now, she was a widow and a mother and being a Carmelite saint, huh? They had an amazing life, but died a Carmelite saint. These are from some of her letters. And these are letters of a, of a Carmelite that understands what we're here to do. If only we were all on fire with love for God. If we were, we should preach love, proclaim love and yet more love, until we had set the whole world on fire. We must have great desires, then God will give us whatever is best for us. We must be careful to free our hearts from everything that might get in the way of the pure love of our beloved Jesus. And right there is at the heart of the crisis of the priesthood. That is the crisis. Because we have divided hearts. And many of us have very divided hearts. And Christ is in there somewhere. But that's not how it has to be. We must be careful to free our hearts from everything that might get in the way of the pure love of our beloved Jesus. He is love itself and wants to give himself to us through love. Jesus is calling us all the time. How long are we going to remain deaf to his voice? No, let us keep our hearts ready, our wills completely for Jesus, our faculties and our senses for the Lord. There must be no undue attachments in our heart for created things. They must burn with love alone, love ever more fervent, for love never says enough, never rests until it is completely on fire. When our hearts are completely on fire with pure love for Jesus, everything that might hinder love from taking complete possession will be cast out. We must not give in to weariness. We must spend every minute in loving God. God alone, the maker of heaven and earth, must be a rest or consolation. The love of God is the only thing we can possess forever. Everything else will pass away. Love, love, and yet more love. Love that is never satisfied. The more we love God, the more we should long to love Him. When we have Jesus in our hearts, we shall have everything else in Him and with Him. That's what the Good Shepherd asks His shepherds to do for His sheep. Direct Him towards Him and His love. I'll stop this sermon, or end this sermon, rather, with, uh, by reading a letter from St. Therese, the great doctor of the church, St. Therese of the Child Jesus. It's on this topic. July 14, 1889. My dear Celine, she's writing to her sister Celine. My soul doesn't leave you. It suffers exile from you. Oh, how hard it is to live to remain on this earth of bitterness and anguish. But tomorrow, in an hour, we shall be at port. What joy! Oh, what a good it will be to contemplate Jesus face to face all through the whole of eternity. Always, always more love. Always more intoxicating joys. A happiness without clouds. What has Jesus done to detach our souls from all that is created? I ah, he struck a big blow, but is a blow of love. God is admirable, but he's especially lovable. Let us love him then. Let us love him enough to suffer for him all that he wills, even spiritual pains, aridities, anxieties, apparent coldness. I hear his great love to love Jesus without feeling the sweetness of this love. This is martyrdom. Well, then let us die as martyrs. O oh, Selene, sweet echo of my soul, do you understand? Unknown martyrdom, known to God alone, which the eye of the creature cannot discover, a martyrdom without honor, without triumph. That is love pushed to the point of heroism. But one day a grateful God will cry out, now my turn. What will we see then? What is this life which will no more have an end? God will be the soul of our soul. 
unfathomable mystery. The eye of man has not seen the uncreated light. His ear has not heard the incomparable harmonies. And his heart cannot have any idea of what God reserves for those whom he loves. And all this will come soon, yes, soon. Let us hurry to fashion our crown. Let us stretch forth our hand to seize the palm. And if we love much, if we love Jesus with a passion, he will not be so cruel as to leave us for a long time on this earth of exile. Selene, during the short moments that remain to us, let us not lose our time. Let us save souls. Souls are being lost like flakes of snow. And Jesus weeps. And we, we are thinking of our sorrow without consoling our fiancé. Oh, Celine, let us live for souls. Let us be apostles. Let us save especially the souls of priests. These souls should be more transparent than crystal. Alas, how many bad priests. Priests who are not holy enough. Let us pray, let us suffer for them. And on the last day, Jesus will be grateful. We shall give him souls. Celine, do you understand the cry of my soul? Together. Together always, Celine, and Therese, of the child Jesus of the Holy Face. During the short moments that remain to us, let us not lose our time. Let us save souls. Souls are being lost like flakes of snow, and Jesus weeps. Let us live for souls. Let us be apostles. Let us save especially the souls of priests. Souls that should be more transparent than crystal. How many bad priests? Priests that are not holy enough. Let us pray. Let us suffer for them, and on the last day, Jesus will be grateful. We shall give him souls.